Thank you everyone for joining our webinar on what to expect when you're expecting a re redesign. My name is Saad Ahmed and I'm a senior strategist here at Vigit and I've been communicating with you for the last several weeks about this presentation. Uh, and today I'm joined with Ali Fouts and Jason Toth. Ali is a creative copywriter here at Vigit. She's been with Vigit for the last three and a half, four years or so and has worked on some of our largest client uh, projects that we've ever had here at Vigit. Uh, specifically, she focuses on helping brands establish tone and voice, helping brands better communicate their stories, and she also does uh, quite a bit of work on the content strategy and content governance side of things. And then Jason Toth is an experienced design director here at Vigit. He's also been here for nearly six years, um, and among the things that he brings to the table is bridging the gap between copywriting and content strategy and taking that into the user experience design and design process. So today they'll be talking to you about the importance of content and how to approach a content during a redesign process. Um, on time and on budget is kind of a mantra to um, get. And so we started trying to figure out how can we help our clients better manage their content so that when we're actually in the redesign phase, um, we can hit the ground running and things can go smoothly um, and we can um, effectively create uh, fantastic uh, digital products that communicate exactly what our clients want to communicate. Um, that's a win for us. Um, and so as we start bouncing around ideas, um, one of the, the most promising that came up was if we all want to tell our story, um, maybe we can just get to our clients a little bit earlier um, and give them the tools to start shaping that story um, before we actually begin um, the initiation of a redesign. Um, so whether this is six or nine or 12 months beforehand, we thought, you know, if we could just sit down um, and sort of lay the track for our clients to start working on the preparation of their content, we would be so far ahead of the game um, once we actually begin our redesign process. Um, and so that's that's why we're here. Um, we wanted to share some of the strategies that um, that we came up with um, that we think will um, will help some of that help end some of that content suffering uh, that uh, we've encountered uh, over the past few years. Uh, so yeah, Ali and I have been working together for a couple of years, and um, we kind of have this running list of common occurrences that uh, have kind of happened in our, some of our largest redesigns. So. The goal today is to kind of structure the webinar around these eight common misconceptions that we have encountered um, several times. Um, what you kind of expect, we're gonna get pretty honest about what we've encountered and some of the ways that you can avoid those misconceptions. Um, we wanna be honest about the progress we've made, some of the wins that we've had, uh, but we also wanna make sure that we um, are being honest in places that we even us feel that we can have some more success. Um, so we'll do a recap a little bit later at the end, but we want to set the stage for some of the kind of key takeaways. Question you're going to ask, am I going to learn anything from these uh, from these guys? Hopefully you will. Um, but the big kind of takeaway that we want to have, kind of spoiler alert here, is um, that content, in our opinion, is uh, everything. It's the most critical aspect to um, the success of any major redesign is much more important, we think, than just having a great looking site, something that's designed well, um, that has a great user experience, that is built well, uh, but that content truly is everything. Uh, we do view it as being kind of the truth. It's going to reveal truth. Uh, we think the content is actually going to reap really great rewards. Um, but what comes along with that is that it's, it's pretty exhausting to deal with content. Um, it's a tedious process to to gather it and to do it well, and it's gonna take time to get it right. Uh, but hopefully that's why you're here and we'll be able to give you some pointers on how you can uh, begin that process a little bit earlier. Um, so as you're going kind of through the webinar, some things that you can uh, sort of listen for. Um, what are some practical ways your organization can create great content? So. Um, you know, thinking about your organization and how right now you're creating it, what are some ways that you can get better at that? Uh, thinking beyond just execution and producing content. So what um, aspect um, 
or what kind of aspects of a redesign are more important than just doing the executing and producing of that content. And then lastly, just think about how your organization is structured and who and how that narrative is being constructed. Um, so that being said, we kind of want to start with just defining what part of the content process that we want to discuss today. Um, for us, this is kind of a, a fairly simplified but typical set of content phases that we encounter. So everything from beginning with your content planning to sort of initiating a project, getting it ready for launch, and then handing it off for um, to be kind of maintained after the launch. Um, Sorry, I'm having some trouble getting through the slides. So, but this kind of brings us to our first kind of major misconception um, that oftentimes these phases look a lot more like this, where uh, not a tremendous amount of time um, is being spent in the planning, in the preparation, the initiation, um, much more time spent in getting all that content ready for launch, uh, this kind of difficult handout, handoff process, and then having to spend a lot of times with um, the actual maintenance of that content because it just hasn't been, um, you know, the proper time wasn't put into the planning. And even sometimes we see the process looking much more like this, where there's hardly any planning or preparation. Um, a lot of the, or the first kind of step in thinking about content is when you initiate a project, having this really painful process of going through getting all that content ready for launch. Um, and then not even many times even considering what happens after handoff and with maintenance. So for Ali and I, the ideal timeline would look much more like this, where this time is front loaded, the major effort and the work is put um, ahead. So in that planning of the content and preparing it, curating it, editing it, um, so that by the time you get to the initiation of a project, um, either through a vendor or internally, you've done a good amount of work so that the launch and the handoff and the maintenance can go much more smoothly. Um, and to kind of help orient you around what we're gonna talk about today, that, that's a lot of kind of, that's a long process to go through and a lot to talk about. So we really just wanna hone in on this first set of, uh, or first three points of the phase. So how you're planning um, that content that you wanna put into a redesign, how are you preparing it, curating it, editing it, writing it, et cetera. And then how do you begin to initiate uh, a project or uh, start talking to an agency or a vendor? So let's jump into phase one. Um, so that's the planning phase. And the first uh, misconception that we wanted to talk about is the idea that we need a new website. Um, you'll note at the bottom there, we've got a danger level um, marked by a number of skulls. Um, this is a four skuller, um, meaning that it is a, um, a misconception that could really lead you down a bad path. Um, and that's because the, the truth the right content strategies and helping our clients successfully create and deliver um, the best type of content when we start with that approach. So what we mean by that, um, I think an excellent example of that is the work that we've um, pretty recently completed for the National Trust for Historic Preservation. So uh, the trust is a privately funded nonprofit organization um, and they work to save America's historic places. Um, they prevent um, sort of these beautiful, uh, beautiful things from becoming strip malls. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we started our, our engagement with the trust, um, they had several different properties um, sort of all serving different purposes. This is an example of what the site looked like, um, I believe, two years ago. 
Um, it was, this was our main organizational site, Preservation Nation. Um, there's a site that was focused on outreach. There's another site for the blog. There's another site for uh, some specific um, organization efforts. Um, so things were spread around and uh, the trust knew that this was a problem they wanted to solve. Um, they had also done a lot of work um, figuring out what audience they wanted to reach. Um, they knew that they were interested in reaching a, a younger demographic and had done some really fantastic work um, to really understand who that audience was, what they were interested in, um, and what were some of the problems that they were experiencing connecting with them. So we were able to do an initial strategy phase with the trust, which was incredibly helpful. Um, it allowed us to spend time with their team, um, doing research, doing workshops, and really going from um, these two problems, uh, how do we consolidate these separate arms um, of our digital properties, and then how do we really successfully reach and engage this new audience. Um, and we were able to, to really come to some solutions together that I think we wouldn't have necessarily come upon if we had just started the entire engagement by saying, we need a new website. Um, and, and one of those key solutions was instead of doing a full redesign of preservationnation.org, which is the organizational site, um, which is would be you know your go-to um, if uh, an organization like the trust came to you saying we need a new website. Um, based on our strategy phase, we realized that actually beginning um, with the saving places, which was their outreach property, um, doing a full revamping of that property was going to be the really smart way to not only start consolidating things, but to also um, effectively reach out to this new audience. So we started by uh, rolling the blog property into Saving Places, um, making Saving Places the um, core Twitter handle, and taking what we knew about this, uh, the audience based on the research that the trust had done, um, we knew that we needed to meet that audience where they were, meaning um, rather than asking that audience to care about preservation, we needed to understand what that audience cared about and then show them how that tied directly to, um, to the preservation efforts of the trust. Um, so this is what Saving Places looked like um, before our redesign effort. So a lot of great information, but, um, but what we were able to do um, by really taking an audience focused approach to this redesign was really use the assets that the trust had to their um, to their best abilities and to position it in a way that um, was really meaningful to the audience that they were trying to reach. Um, so again, this is not organizationally facing content. This is audience facing content. Um, and we were able to do this because not only do they have great uh, photography, but the trust has an incredible team of writers. And so we knew that this was a content strategy that they would be able to support. Um, but I, I, again, I don't think that this is something that we have, would have landed upon if um, when, when we all walked through the door, the idea was let's, let's redesign the site. Um, I think that this was a solution that came directly out of saying, um, these are the organizational problems. Um, and let's figure out a way to solve them and let's make the most of our organization's resources when we do that. And, and by resources, we of course mean content resources. And conception, misconception number two um, is another biggie um, and it's that our content problems are design or development related. And I think it's very tempting to um, to think that if you've got a site that feels old or clunky or a little outdated, um, that the, the reason that perhaps people aren't engaging with your content um, or the reason that you're not able to produce it on a regular basis is because of a design or development issue. But um, time and time again, what we were finding is that um, in truth, uh, if you have content problems, it's because they're content related. And the solution to that is to do an honest assessment um, of the state of your content to find out what it would really take. Um, so in terms of labor, in terms of time um, to improve that content. So that could be uh, content strategy, uh, that could be 
um, content quality. Um, if you're able to, um, either if you have the resources on your team or if you need to engage um, uh, another agency to help you do that type of a qualitative and quantitative inventory, um, it's incredibly helpful. So uh, a great example of why this is so important is um, our work with the White House Historical Association. So this is a fantastic, fantastic organization. They um, are responsible not only for maintaining the interiors of the house, keeping those restored and renovated, um, but they also are sort of have the, the ultimate uh, uh, sort of record of White House history. Um, they have an incredible photography um, collection. They have uh, fantastic historians on uh, staff. So the quality of their content was fantastic, but um, the structuring, the content strategy um, was, was where we were really seeing some issues. Um, the site hadn't been redesigned in 10 years. And, um, and it was also not on a CMS, it was on just hard-coded HTML. And so we really wanted to find a way to um, not necessarily change the content, but to train, change the way that um, we presented that content, the way that we grouped the content, the way that we structured it. Um, we were able to do a content strategy phase and overall digital strategy phase with uh, the White House um, uh, before we engage in the redesign. So again, you're seeing how that's a really key, helpful um, helpful phase to enter. Um, and one of the ideas that came out of that was the idea that you need to democratize content, um, that we need to let people access content as they prefer to access it. So this is once we actually got in and started digging around. Um, the the uh, White House was really sure um, how much content they had and how that had grown over the past decade. Um, and so the solution that we came up with was to really break all the content into pieces, so really to just smash it. Um, so as I say that, um, <laughs> what it turned out was that the design and development aspects of this were really far less complicated than the best solution that we were able to come up with um, for redeveloping um, their content strategy. So we were really informal. They were a really great team to work with. We did a lot of sketching with them. Um, but what that meant is we had to come up with a plan for stripping the site um, of all of its content manually. Um, and we, uh, with the help of some of our, our good buddies at Gather Content, um, Gather Content, if you haven't used it, is a tool um, it's really collaborative that sort of lets you organize um, and produce and publish content um, uh, in a really systematic way. And we were able to use that tool to take all of the stripped content um, that we pull from the site and then reorganize it. Um, we use some of Gather Content's um, sort of workflow tagging. Um, we had a really talented front end developer that was able to repurpose some of that when she built a uh, plugin that allowed us to import then all of that stripped, reorganized, and retagged content into the CMS we were using called Craft. Um, and so finally, when all of that work was done, um, then we simply just got to apply our design and development solutions, which pretty much surrounded around uh, getting out of the way of the content. Um, fantastic photography, fantastic writing, um, and the fact that we had stripped it all down and made each piece of content independent, but also easily able to associate with other pieces of content meant that we could then create collections that were far more um, intuitive for users. So um, instead of having to go down timelines, you were able to see um, collections of all the portraits of the first ladies um, or um, the history of the White House uh, Easter egg roll, which you can see here, which was a huge, a huge win and just bubbled up um, so much of this really fascinating content that had been kind of buried in a, in a structural format that was hard to access. Um, so this was the right solution and it, I think we're all really happy with the result. Um, I think what's important to remember is that um, because we didn't really know what we were stepping into um, in terms of content when we started the project, um, we didn't realize that we were going to have to take 1,200 pieces of content and manually 
break those down um, and put them into a new CMS. Um, so this was a, a huge undertaking that really involved more than 500 hours of labor just to deal with prepping and uh, and restructuring the content. So, um, so I think that that's, again, it was worth it. <laughs> but I think knowing that six months beforehand, I think, um, would have been um, would have been fantastic, and I think we would have been able to find um, even more effective ways of handling the content if we had had gone in with the eyes eyes wide open on that one. So the, the last misconception that we want to talk about during the planning phase, um, it, it's certainly a lot less dangerous. You can see it's only a, a two scholar on the danger level. Um, but it's, it's extremely important if you intend on taking a more data-informed approach to your project, which in many cases is true. Uh, this statement that, hey, we've installed analytics, so we know how people are using our site. Um, it's, a, it's a quote that we hear very frequently at the beginning of almost every project that we work on. Um, but the problem is, uh, really, you've just kind of installed analytics. Uh, don't mean to be harsh about that, but as you know, we have a full kind of, or you may know, we have a full data and analytics team. And we've talked to them, they estimate that about 85% of our projects have at least one significant issue with how um, a client has set up their analytics. So what is happening is it's providing either misleading or false data. You might have the abnormal number of, of page views, for example, because you're tracking that incorrectly. Um, and so that kind of froze off actually the data that you're receiving um, and this doesn't even account for the many other projects in which you know we get on a project and the data set up isn't even usable um, so the solution and while this may sound pretty simple is that we encourage clients to start consulting with an analytics expert um, a year before you hire an agency um, and the key reason for this is that if your analytics aren't set up correctly uh, from the beginning, then it's going to delay how uh, useful that information is or how much it can inform the design decisions that an agency would use. So if, if that isn't set up correctly, um, most of the time we're having to take anywhere from two to three weeks to set it up correctly. After that, we need to have about another four weeks minimum just to get a month's worth of data that we capture. Um, so at that point, you're talking about seven or eight weeks into uh, the beginning of a redesign in which you're not able to use that data to inform some of the early decisions that you need to make in a project. So it's, it's especially important to make sure that your analytics are set up correctly so that when you decide and initiate that project, you can hit the ground running um, and have that uh, influence your design. So as a recap of the planning, um, we talked about starting with a problem-oriented, not solution-oriented approach. So rather than immediately jumping into the idea that we just need to overhaul everything and have a redesign, um, let's step back and, and look at what problems are there and whether or not a redesign would actually solve those. As Ali talked about, we want to honestly assess your content. You know, if you have 1,200 pieces of content um, and you really want that to be accessible in a variety of different ways, we need to talk pretty honestly about what it's going to take to improve that and to organize it. And then lastly, as we just mentioned, consult with an analytics expert to make sure that you can get that data-informed um, process that you want to have in your redesign. So moving forward, we want to step into the next phase, which we talked about, which is preparation. Uh, the first misconception here is that uh, the only tool we need to manage our website is a CMS. And this misconception was really born out of the idea of uh, seeing clients overemphasize the role that a CMS plays in organizing and shaping content. Um, a phrase we frequently hear is, if we only had a better CMS, we could just do so much more on our site. So this idea that the CMS is sort of going to be the thing that resolves a lot of content-related issues. Um, but the truth of the matter is, when it comes to your content, your CMS is, is probably the least important tool there. Uh, we wholeheartedly believe that a CMS plays a, a major role in the management of your content. It can certainly affect the day-to-day -day happiness that you have around kind of site and content maintenance, um, but it's not really a tool to help you determine what content should you know, tell your organization's story. Um, and so the solution we have is you need to use your content to shape rather than fill your templates. 
So this solution kind of harkens back to the catalyst basically for the entire webinar is that we need to be thinking about that content preparation and planning well before we're thinking about how we're going to actually build this or the CMS. Um, and that's going to result in your constant, your content shaping the kinds of templates in your CMS that you build rather than just having content that you're going to jam into a template design that you've created. Um, and for us, a great example of this was some work we were able to do with GoPole. Uh, GoPole is a third party vendor uh, that makes mounts and accessories for GoPro cameras. Um, they're essentially building selfie sticks before selfie sticks were kind of a popular trend. Um, <clears throat> this was their previous site before we did the redesign. Um, their products are great. They have great kind of brand recognition, very loyal customers. Um, it's a very niche product, so uh, you have a lot of kind of extreme sports enthusiasts, um, which really emphasize and are big on the experience and kind of what uh, what this product is kind of going to give them. Um, none of that was reflected in the way that their site was designed, and in particular, the product pages, which were pretty pedantic. Um, so we came in and, and really wanted to concentrate on how do we really capture sort of the the kind of use and interactive qualities, um, the attitude of their audience, and how, do, how would we do that through their products. Um, this is an example of the product page that they previously had. So you can see a lot of text, just some very basic kind of product images, um, features in a bulleted list. And this is uh, the beginning half of our product page. Still have some of this e-commerce, but as I'll show you in a second, um, pulling in a lot of content that's user generated uh, and a lot of kind of expressing the interactivity and the mechanisms of the actual products themselves through the page. Um, but what that meant that we actually had to start by really understanding what kind of content was at our disposal. So we had to understand each of the products. We had to understand what particular audience they might be um, targeting. Uh, what was the tagline? What was all the feature sets? What kinds of interactions could happen with that product? And once we got all of that content, then we were able to um, collectively see if we were going to create a template and we were going to have a set of repeatable interactive modules that would uh, display on uh, this common template, where were the commonalities in the interactions between these products? So if one product, uh, for example, bobbed up and down in the water, it was an animation that we wanted to create, how could that be paired with a product that would uh, telescope out um, to different heights? And so after we um, kind of went through the process of kind of creating those spreadsheets, we then um, start thinking about the actual design of the template. So Kind of at the beginning here, you see the first stage of the e-com kind of module, which is then followed by a set of uh, user-generated content. These are images taken by users using these products, um, which is important for us to kind of convey. We had a module that uh, displayed the video, promotional video. This is an example of the telescoping module. So that's actually 24 individual frames uh, of an image that make it seem as if there's, there's an animation. That's followed by um, other modules that demonstrate how other accessories are attached to their products. And all this is actually built within the CMS to a really robust set of customizable um, modules that define what, um, where the XY coordinate of images on the page, um, et cetera. And these can be repeated across all of the products that exist. Uh, key takeaway here being that we would not have been able to create such kind of sophisticated and visually rich and interactive templates had we not first gone through the due diligence to really understand uh, the content and the commonalities uh, among all those products. Um, the fifth misconception here is that agencies make beautiful websites. Um, and while we, we greatly appreciate when we get this kind of compliment, especially on our own work, um, the reality is, is that agencies only make beautiful websites with great organizational partners. Um, we 
uh, and how we talk about kind of the solution for this is that we try to kind of coach our clients to understand that you need to plan to get out of your redesign what you're going to put into it. Um, we can certainly help shape that content. We can help you shape your narrative. We can help you understand how to organize um, and, and curate some of that content. But at the end of the day, uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into making uh, many of the websites that you see in our portfolio or other agencies. And a good example of that is our work with uh, WWF, the World Wildlife Fund. Um, this is probably one of the most cited uh, projects that we have done. Um, it uh, conceivably was because it was one of the first kind of major site redesigns um, that was responsive. Um, but what was really kind of critical with that is that um, the the content that they had was really rich. There was um, a tremendous amount of that content, but they really needed to overhaul that content. And when we kind of hear that, there are typically kind of three major factors that we start thinking about there, or that lots of people think about. You know, what's sort of the budget? How much time do we have to do this? And sort of what's the complexity of the content? And while those are great starting points, and a lot of people would say you can kind of the old adage, you can have two of these, but not three. Um, for us, it actually ends up being a lot more nuanced than that. And the questions we start asking is, well, you know, how large is the organization, which affects the amount of content and decision making and number of opinions on content? Now, just how much content is on the site? Is there a rebrand that's happening concurrently with the site redesign? Is the organization going through a major strategy reset? Um, how much customization is required? Kind of what's the skill of the staff? These are the kind of questions that we really think um, contribute to uh, content and, and how much time it's going to take. So for something like WWF, um, they kind of wanted a high degree of complexity with the templates. They're a you know, big, massive organization with a lot of content. Um, the quality at this point was a little bit, we needed to ramp up the quality of that content. Um, but positives, they had really great copywriters on staff um, and uh, their skill in kind of writing was evident. Um, but we bring this up to say that there's kind of a story behind the scenes that goes along that. So, you know, you see the kind of beautiful templates, the complexity of those templates. Um, but again, sort of the planning that went into that um, is evident then in, in the result. So for them, it was five years since their last major kind of site or content redesign. They had done a couple of reskins, but the reality was the content had not been touched. The architecture had, hadn't been touched in a while and wasn't really reflective. So we knew we had kind of a, they knew that they had a big kind of push um, to get that where they wanted. And so as a result of that, they, they put in the resources to having to hiring um, new team members. They identified a senior editor that was going to lead specifically a team of copywriters and um, interns throughout uh, the summer to really craft the content to, to uh, display and to generate the kind of messages that they wanted around um, the work that they did. As a result, they spent three months on just alone on content definition, curating that content, editing it, creating new content. So that's full time a team spending three months just on that alone, <clears throat> which ended up resulting in about 1200 hours um, that the client spent by themselves that were just dedicated to the content. Uh, and again, we don't, we don't want to say this to you know, put fear um, in people's minds or to uh, talk about this being such a daunting task. Uh, but this is kind of evident and we wanted to be truthful that this is the kind of um, kind of dedication and time and effort that goes into large or organizations going through redesigns that haven't happened in quite a few years. They want to really reshape and reframe how they talk about themselves. Great. And so uh, the last misconception in our uh, preparation phase is this idea that <clears throat> this redesign will help us get our stuff together as an organization. Um, and we've got this as a, as a highest danger level because it's, it's really tempting to think, well, everyone's going to have their, all their hands on deck. Um, we're all going to be working on it. And we know we've got some other issues, um, but we'll just all, we'll, we'll wait to sort it out till we really get started on the project. 
Um, and, and the reason that this is such an issue is because the truth is that the shortcomings of your organization really are going to be the shortcomings of your site. Um, and what we, what we mean when we say that is that if you're having trouble um, describing who you are, what you do, and why as an organization, um, that problem is not going to be solved simply by um, uh, reskinning your site or even um, embarking on what would traditionally be a regular redesign. Um, that is a problem that we can help clients solve, but that is when um, the process becomes um, maybe longer than we might have expected. And I think that um, that that if you can take time um, before um, you actually begin the redesign process, identify what the problem is. Um, is it because there's not agreement about what you do? Is there not agreement about the vision for the organization? Um, what is causing um, some of the particularly content issues that you see on your site? Um, and we're not immune to that. Um, so we just went through a redesign ourselves. Um, we're um, which was an empathy building uh, process, certainly. Um, and we're an organization that is basically equal parts engineers and designers. Um, but, but what that means is that um, while I think that's a huge asset to our clients, it means that we have a lot of different points of view uh, when it comes to how we talk about what we do. Um, so in our previous site, on the left-hand side, you can see how we made an attempt at describing our services. Um, it's, it's a lot of copy. It's broken up very organizationally. So it's broken up by the labs, as we call them, strategy, design, and development. Um, it's a lot of information. And, and when we undertook, um, knew that we were going to undertake this, uh, this redesign process, we spent time thinking about how should we really present what we do to our audience. And we decided to go with a far more audience-focused uh, approach. So you can see now that we describe our services under the headings of products, experiences, and tools. And that is much more in line with um, what our clients are looking for when they come through the door. Um, um, nobody generally comes in the door saying, you know, um, I. I want X, Y, Z uh, job titles on my project. They're, they're looking for a single solution um, to a larger problem. And so um, I think this is an example of how really putting, putting in the work to um, go through the sometimes tricky process of figuring out how you want to present yourself to the world, um, doing that before um, you actually have a kickoff um, is incredibly helpful. So as just a recap of this section, um, you, uh, we went through the idea that uh, you do need to use your content to shape um, rather than just fill your templates. Um, you want to realize that you are going to really get out of your re redesign what you're willing to put in as an organization. Um, and that if you've got problems uh, with your content, it, it, it is really helpful to identify the source of that uh, content dysfunction. Uh, before you really initiate a redesign process. Indeed, I am. Oh, sorry about that. So, uh, yeah, this is the last phase, initiation. Um, we have two more misconceptions to go through, and then we should have some time for questions uh, at the end. So in, in this phase, we want to deal with just sort of the initial project initiation, um, initiating that kind of relationship potentially with an agency and kind of kicking off um, a project. And, and the mis first misconception that we want to go over here is that multitasking will save us time. Um, and this was born out of working on numerous projects in which there was a, a lot of tasks happening even outside of the work that we were doing with a client. And that was resulting in projects just not necessarily reaching their full potential. Um, and by multitasking, we're really referring to uh, like a redesigned time frame that includes everything from a rebrand to doing a strategy reset to a complete content overhaul, you know, throwing in a new identity, and then, yeah, we want all that on a completely new platform or a CMS. Um, and the truth of the matter is, is that long-term planning is actually what's gonna help you save time, not just packing all of that in uh, to like a nine-month window 
that you believe is going to you know, kind of be resolved through multitasking. Um, and probably more importantly, the solution that we, we have here, and again, one even one of the catalysts for this webinar, is trying to help clients move away from this flip the switch approach to your website redesign. So rather than, you know, on day uh, 780, you know, you have a site and then the next day you end up having a completely new site, uh, new brand, new content, and expect kind of users to, to be uh, kind of pulled into that. Um, how do we actually plan for that in a little bit of a smarter way? Um, and a great example of this is some work that we've done with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Um, so besides being a, a global nonprofit that's focused on land conservation, um, they're also a group that manages several uh, facilities such as Bronx Zoo, New York Aquarium, Queen Zoo. Um, they also have over 500 global projects happening and they sponsor any number of campaigns throughout the year uh, that raise awareness on conservation. And then included in that, they also have their full organization site. Um, but what's really interesting about the way that they went about this is that from the start of the engagement to the actual redesign of the org site um, was about a two year window. And they didn't start with, a, with the org redesign. What they actually started with was redesigning um, the ticket sale experience, so just that sort of e-com or online ticket sale experience for one facility, which was the Bronx Zoo. Um, and from there, they're able to do some A-B testing to determine the, the most optimal design for that particular experience. It also gave us some time to do some campaign work um, on the backside. And then that led to us actually being able to redesign the full facility site for the Bronx Zoo. We were able to do some more facility testing on that to make sure that we were um, optimizing that site as best we could for users while still doing some campaign work. At that point, we felt comfortable in launching it and then going into actual thinking about the way that the CMS would be designed in a way that that uh, the kind of entire site template could be used for the rest of the facilities, so New York Aquarium, uh, Queen Zoo, et cetera. We continue to do campaign work in the background, learning even more about the way that uh, the organization communicated. We launched those facility sites, which then led us up to the point where we were able to redesign the actual um, Wildlife Conservation Society full organization site. Um, so it, it didn't quite flip it on its head, but rather than kind of start with the biggest organization site and then try to drive things down, uh, we actually started really small and then drove things up, which allowed for a much easier and more successful redesign of a large organization site. Um, and then this is the last uh, misconception, um, and it's it's a real quick one, but we thought uh, it's an important one to um, to bring up. And it's the idea that you know it takes a village to launch a successful website, and and the reason that this is uh, a dangerous misconception is because in in reality in many cases um, it takes a benevolent dictator to launch a successful website and, and what we mean by that is um, on many of our most successful projects um, one of the key and uh, hidden factors um, is that we have a, a primary client contact who is just an amazing collaborator, um, an amazing leader within their organization, and has an uncanny ability to just get stuff done. Um, and, and so what that, that has told us is that um, if you are at an organization that's considering a redesign, one of the other things that uh, would really benefit from thought several months ahead of uh, actually engaging an agency is um, really intentionally choosing the person that's going to lead that redesign um, at your organization. It, it, it will make a huge difference um, and it has every single time we've had just, uh, we've been really fortunate to have really outstanding um, key contacts in so many of our projects and um, they're so often the unsung heroes um, of these successful um, successful redesigns. So um, when you think about all the qualifications you put in an RFP, um, think about whether the person actually leading the redesign in the organizational and um, what qualifications do they bring to the table. And oftentimes it doesn't have to be technical qualifications. 
it's leadership and collaboration um, that really get it done. And so, um, recap, move away from the flip to switch approach to your website redesign and choose the person who will internally lead your redesign as carefully as you choose your agency. Um, and that is it. That was a ton of information. Um, so we're going to hand it over to Saad now who's going to manage some of these questions that we've got coming in. Yes, Ali, Jason, thank you very much. And for all the attendees that are still here, there's quite a, quite a few of you. I've been getting several questions and I've been trying to answer them as directly as possible um, within the chat console, but there are a few that uh, should better be served by Jason and Allie themselves. So one question that Jonathan uh, Kalodner asked was, what does benevolent dictator really mean? Is that a visionary project manager on the agency side, or is that a key contact on the client side? So Allie, Jason, I'll let mm -hmm. you two decide who, to, who will answer that. Um, I would say that it's a key contact on the client side. Um, I would say another description for that person is a human shield um, that it's someone who sees the big picture, um, is able to come to consensus with us um, about what the, the primary needs of the project are and how we're going to meet those needs. And then it's someone who's able to help their organization um, help us um, solve those challenges. And, um, and often, Things are happening behind the scenes that we don't even know about. So there are um, internal questions that are raised and answered, um, disputes that are settled, decisions that are made, and often um, they aren't even things that we are, are aware are taking place because uh, the contact has acted as a human shield and has in many, many ways laid the foundation um, for approvals. Um, and it's, it is a tough job, um, and it's, it, but it is just incredibly important um, and incredibly helpful. So it, it's someone who usually helps us do our job by letting us focus on the things that we're equipped to do uh, the best, and then helps, um, in some ways this is a little selfish, but helps shield us from the things that would often um, that maybe we're not very well equipped to address that are better equipped internally that they're better equipped to address internally um, and that as they pile up can start to add time and budget to a project thanks Allie. Um, another question uh, this is from felix gilbert uh, felix mentioned uh, does Vigit follow the agile development process and if so does do your copywriters also follow that same process and then he had uh, a related question around the time that should be allotted to upfront uh, content creation. So two, two questions from Gilbert, uh, Felix. Uh, one is process around uh, copywriting and whether we follow some sort of agile method, and then how much time is usually required upfront for content creation. Um, I worry that agile is, a light content strategy and that it means a million different things to a million different people. So I don't know if I, I'll ask you the second question and see if, if there's any further, if you can shed any more context on what you mean. And if not, I'll just swing for it. But um, time to write content. Um, we usually, if we have a strategy, voice and tone in place, we sort of I don't know, Saad will go insane if I actually have an hour estimate here, but um, I would say anywhere between four to eight pages, uh, 48 hours per page. Um, if, if we already know what we're, if, if you can tell us who you are, what you do and why, if that is already decided, already in place, if, if that is information that's already been settled on, um, then we can hit the ground running and just start writing. And, and then that's anywhere between 48 hours for a page four to eight hours for a page and a page is how long is that you know that's a, a normal <laughs> normalish page um, if there is no consensus about messaging um, so if if we're not able to to immediately understand and there's no organizational consensus on who you are what you do and why who you want to talk to and what you want to say to them um, 
I would say that rather than add hours onto a, a content creation estimate, um, I think that it means adding at least some sort of strategy engagement to the start of the project to um, to come up with the answers to those questions. Um, so I, I see those as two sort of separate executions. Um, and I don't know, do we have any more definition of what we mean by agile copywriting process? Um, well, then, then what I will say is that um, I think the process is very agile when it comes to copywriters and art directors working together. Um, and I'll loop uh, front end developers into that as well. Um, uh, I think our most successful projects are where we move our desks together and then um, work together for the duration of the project. And that usually just involves untold amounts of chair scooting and moving your desk around to the other side. Um, so I, I, that is different than development's definition of Agile, I would believe, but they are two sort of different disciplines. So, um, so pro Agile, if it means working with your art director all the time. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. Um, another great question coming in, or here's another great question uh, regarding client services. And uh, Damon mentions that he agrees that content should shape templates. What bothers him or what's on his mind is how do we communicate that to clients? Um, and how do we explain the time and effort required to truly accomplish uh, content writing before we get the templates? He says, uh, one of his questions that often comes up is, what do you mean it'll take three weeks for just content? We just want to launch a site in two months. <laughs> Great question, David. Yeah. Um, well, I think that question it pretty much sums up the reason that Allie and I have been thinking about this for the past couple of years and wanted to have the webinar is, um, to, to start the conversation and begin evangelizing that we've we've got to somehow find a way to flip the order in which we're sort of thinking about um, or the process by which we're doing massive redesigns. Um, I, I think in our case, we've been able to build up uh, either a set of clients and or a set of examples that indicate and show, um, you know, if if you want this type of care with your content, if you want this kind of visuals, if you want this kind of interactivity, um, if you want this type of copywriting, then um, we can prove through documentation that those things happened prior to creating templates and that then those templates, you know, were used to shape that. Um, e even we work on projects, you know, if we're going to be honest, that, that don't allow that kind of content um, time. In those cases, what we tend to do is just, you know, prioritize what aspects of the content need the most um, help. So there's been some times where, you know, Allie has had a you know, reduction in the amount of kind of copywriting assistance that she's able to give. And, you know, we focus either on a key, a few key pages or, um, you know, maybe more importantly, uh, the figuring out the architecture of the site in terms of content is going to be more critical. Um, and one other example I would have is the work we did on Duke admissions. If you go to that site, there's kind of four really robust kind of critical pages around the Duke experience. And I would say that was a case in which we spent a tremendous amount of time interviewing students, um, gathering kind of content into particular templates and that that, that was the really drove and was the catalyst for, um, how those, those templates were created. We did not take that same amount of time on other pages on the site for things like budget and, and timeline. Um, but overall, kind of a long-winded way of saying, um, I don't think there's a, at this point, it reminds me a little bit of the way UX was probably 12 years ago, where it was just, it was beginning to kind of catch some steam. People were beginning to kind of understand, you know, what is this thing, user experience design, and why should I care about it? Um, and 12 years later, we rarely even have to talk about you know, the value of that to a client. I think with, you know, good web copywriting and content strategy, um, I think in 10 years, once more conversations like this happen and the more we evangelize with clients and you all do, even in your own organizations, um, we're going to make some, some big progress. Just a decade away. Decade away. <laughs> Let's try to get down to five years. Yeah. <laughs> 
So there was another question on Twitter. There was, a, what is it? Oh yeah, this is a great question. So Bobby asked, who's responsible for content? The web team or the marketing team? Um, I, I think, um, well, I guess, I, I guess that, I guess I'm assuming that's organ at the organization level. Um, I think it is the person best able to produce that content. Um, I think that maybe that's not a helpful answer, but um, but but the spirit of that is, I think that we're moving farther and farther away from this titled person does this thing. Um, I think we're trying to move away from it at, at Viget. We have. Um, uh, some of our digital analysts pitching in in UX, um, you know, we have UX designers um, helping with art direction, we have art directors writing, it, you know, it's, I think that if you should pick the strongest writer to create your content or the strongest writers you can find, and, and those people may be lurking in places you had not anticipated. Um, but I think that, um, I think that if you have not already, if, if the marketing team hasn't clearly communicated um, messaging, um, again, like what's the concise way to explain who you are as an organization, what you do as an organization, and why you do it, um, then uh, then you need their input on that. Um, and if the web team um, has people on staff to write, um, then then use them. So. Uh, I think that they, they need to depend on each other, and what's most important is the best best writer should win. Because if you're going to spend the time, um, getting the most out of it is, is certainly ideal. All right, thank you. Uh, there's a question from Paola Rico. Uh, she mentioned that, or yeah, she mentioned that she works for a large university, and one of the challenges that uh, she faces is uh, walling off content or making certain parts of the site inaccessible to their clients. Um, so the question was, you know, how how do we approach, um, you know, client side user roles and content governance and determining who should have access to what content within a site and within a redesign? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I, I think it 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 partly gets back to one of the, the sort of misconceptions that we had around, uh, I, I hesitate to use that's the phrase that it's a dysfunction in the organization, but um, it, it, it is a problem in that most organizations want to have kind of a cross divisional or cross organization story being told. And Ali and I have seen this you know, many, many times in the past years there, there's more of a groundswell to tell that full organizational story the problem is as you mentioned that content um, is locked into organizations or silos of divisions groups within the larger organization um, what we found is it's going to be next to impossible to tell that story to unlock that content until there are structural changes in the organization in which you have a sort of a, a content czar, or as Ali mentioned, a benevolent dictator, even on the client side that has nothing to do with the project, who is responsible for owning and understanding and having access to that content across those divisions. Um, and it, it's one of the more sad parts, sort of our job is when we hear and we, we have clients that want to tell that story and we sort of know almost from the beginning, that that's a wonderful aspiration and we'd love to help you do that. The problem is you are not going to be able to tell that story because fundamentally your organization doesn't allow for that story to be told. Um, and so for us, again, advocating that organizations start to see the value in having someone understand and and kind of manage content across multiple divisions instead of that being siloed. Uh, that's a great first step. And then, you know, 
essentially having access to that content, which would then give us access to that story and be able to help shape that um, in your digital communication. Great, thank you very much. Uh, Jason, uh, wait, sorry, not Jason. So for all the attendees here, uh, we'll do one more question and then we'll go ahead and wrap. So there's a question from Alan Rogers. He mentioned that, uh, he, he mentioned that what's the correct way to make sure that your analytics setup is actually implemented the right way? And, and why does it take two to three, two to three weeks to set up? Um, so that's probably a question that Toth might be able to best answer, but ultimately, um, Alan, you know, reach out to us and check out our blog posts. We have a lot of content on the blogs uh, related to analytics and setup, and then send me an email or find me on Twitter, and I'll connect you with one of our analytics folks on our team. Yeah, so I, I can give a quick short answer to that. Um, yeah, when, when I mentioned the two to three weeks, that's, that's a typical timeline we see mostly just in being able to access the analytics, get authentication to be able to get on there, uh, do, go through the research of um, kind of doing an analytics audit, and then being able to help, you know, kind of make adjustments or changes in the way that that data is being captured. Um, so some of that's probably a little bit, I wouldn't say exaggerated, but that two weeks is also has time built in and just in kind of knowledge transfer and, and communication between a vendor and a client. Um, some of the things that the analytics team in, in particular have uh, cited as being kind of issues in particular is like integration with other um, systems. So in particular, if you have, you know, any kind of other uh, CRM or um, e-com platforms, anything along that line that is like kind of um, resulting in our inability to truly see what behavior is on a site, uh, that can be difficult. It's especially true in terms of signups and donations because there's almost always third parties that are being platforms that are being used for that. So, you know, kind of wading through and discovering what the problem is with that and then how to work with those third parties to accurately get kind of donation or signup information. That's, um, that's really where a lot of that time uh, is spent. Um, that and then also just in many ways that a lot of the analytics are siloed or certain parts of the site are siloed um, either from like as the previous question alluded to you know organizations or divisions within organizations controlling those analytics so if you can imagine a user moving across you know certain um, aspects of a site which are controlled by different divisions in an organization that means you know the tracking of that can sometimes um, not be accurate so that's really what we mean by kind of the two or three weeks set up, uh, which is why, again, you know, if we can get, if, if you can get that done a lot earlier then you know, whoever you work with, they're just going to be so grateful that they will have had one year's worth of data um, to kind of look on. And the last one I'll make there is if, if for those of you that are either EDU clients or, you know, others that have some kind of like cyclical, uh, kind of set of engagements with your users, it's even, again, more critical to get in that year-long cycle. So if you're an admissions team and, you know, every spring you release X, um, you know, if we can only come in and we start running analytics in September for, you know, a, a spring launch and analytics for the spring were never set up, then we just miss kind of a critical, like, part of your process um, in capturing. However, you know, again, if you kind of set that up properly a year before, uh, then you know that we're going to have the right kind of information. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jason, for that elaborate answer. Um, and again, Ali and Jason, thanks again for taking the time out of your busy day uh, to spend time talking about why content is so important to our projects and why content should be an equally important part of your process for those of you who are still here and attending. Um, and finally, you know, I just wanted to say thank you for attending, thank you for joining, and as you can see from the screen, if you want, want to reach out to any one of us, uh, those are our various hashtags. Um, slide some way, yep. <laughs> and uh, we'll be uploading this webinar as a recording to YouTube, and then we'll also be sending out a PDF of the presentation uh, later, later today or early tomorrow. 
Uh, so with that, uh, I bid you adieu, and thank you very much, and have a good day. Bye. Bye.